The first step in the mechanism of serine proteases is the actual binding of the substrate to what is known as the specificity pocket. The specificity pocket conveys the, specif the specific amino acids that are to be cut by the specific protease. As an example, trypsin is a serine protease that cuts at C-terminal lysine and arginine residues. So that specificity pocket will be accommodative towards those basic amino acids, lysine and arginine. Another example of a serine protease that's specific for a site of amino acids would be chymotrypsin. Chymotrypsin cuts at C-terminal phenylalanine and tyrosine residues, the aromatic amino acids. So those um, specific, so that specificity pocket would be accommodative towards those amino acids. So basically, the specificity pocket discriminates between different amino acid cut sites. Now, all serine proteases, regardless if they come from bacteria or to higher mammalian organisms, have three conserved amino acid residues. Hence, this is the, one of the reasons why serine proteases are of paramount importance to study because they are a classic example of convergent evolution, where a serine protease from bacillus versus a serine protease from our digestive tract may have different or divergent three-dimensional structures or a very different tertiary structure. But the catalytic triad consisting of these three conserved amino acid residues would still be there and could probably overlay them as well. So this uh, catalytic triad, as it's known, consists of three conserved you know, universal amino acids amongst all serine proteases. They are serine, which actually does the nucleophilic attack, histidine, which provides a crucial and essential hydrogen bond, and aspartic acid, which also uh, devotes a very important hydrogen bond. So if you mutate any one of these three amino acid residues, you'd have a significant reduction the enzymatic activity of that serine protease, you would have a, um, a detrimental loss of the KM and Vmax values uh, for that enzyme's functioning. You can see what uh, these uh, three amino acids actually do. The serine actually does the SN2 nucleophilic attack on the susceptible peptide bond. Now, you have here on the histidine an N3 atom on the side chain of histidine, the so-called amid uh, amidazolium side chain. The N3 imidazolium atom has a very crucial hydrogen bond with the OH of the serine. And the net effect of that is that this hydrogen bond is pulling electron density towards the N3 atom. Reinforcing that is a critical hydrogen bond between the NH or the N1H atom belonging to the imidazole side chain and the C double bond O belonging to the side chain of aspartic acid. That also pulls electron density and polarity towards the, the uh, oxygen atom. So the net effect of all of this is that you actually have an electron density and polarity through this hydrogen bonded network that pulls um, polarity towards the direction of the red arrows. And as a net effect of all of that, this oxygen atom becomes much more nucleophilic and more potent in its nucleophilic activity in attacking this susceptible carbonyl group of the peptide bond. So the peptide bond here is donated, denoted by the C double bond O and H group. So the very first step in uh, the mechanism of serine proteases, almost universal across all domains of life, is binding of the substrate to the specificity pocket. But keep in mind this important hydrogen bond in that. So removing a histidine removes this hydrogen bond and results in a loss of function of the protease. Removing this aspartic acid removes this hydrogen bond and you remove that polarity, that pulling action, making this oxygen very nucleophilic and that result in mutating or substitution of this aspartic acid also um, results in loss of enzymatic activity. So these hydrogen bonds are critical and they are crucial, hence almost the universal conservation of these three amino acids. This is a good example of convergent evolution where you can have serine proteases diverge into three-dimensional structure but converge in terms of their catalytic mechanisms. Now, as we stated before, the first step is binding of the substrate to the specificity pocket. The specificity pocket allows for the cut site to, de 
be determined across all these families of serine proteases. Notice again our catalytic triad. That's going to remain invariant regardless of the serine protease that we're going to be talking about. Now, as the serine protease begins to attack this um, substrate that's bound to the specificity pocket, remember again this hydrogen bonding network that makes this oxygen very nucleophilic. So this oxygen atom is going to do an SN2 attack on this carbon atom. This pair of electrons on this double bond go to oxygen, and now you have what's known as an oxyanion. The oxyanion is actually accommodated in many serine proteases through an oxyanion hole, a region of the enzymatic active site that contains small amino acid side chains or positively charged amino acid side chains that stabilize that negative charge of the oxyanion. So the nucleophilic attack on the susceptible carbonyl group of the peptide bond, here is our peptide bond, and you notice here that hydrogen bonding is pulling and pulling and really getting that hydrogen more towards that N3 imidazolium atom of the histidine side chain, allowing for serine to perform its nucleophilic attack. Now, once you have that nucleophilic attack, you have what's called a tetrahedral intermediate. This tetrahedral intermediate is very unstable, and it has a very transient half-time or half-life. Here's the oxyanion hole. The oxyanion hole would be stabilized by several amino acids that are small, like a glycine, or have positively charged side chain, because this negative charge on the oxygen needs stabilization. So most uh, serine proteases have a site that will um, favor the accommodation of the oxyanion hole. So here is your tetrahedral intermediate. The tetrahedral intermediate collapses when this pair of electrons on the oxygen atom go back to form the C double bond O, and this pair of electrons goes back to the nitrogen. So the N terminus actually leaves, and we are finished with the first half of this mechanism. The tetrahedral intermediate breaks down. The N terminal portion of our protein actually leaves as it's shown here, and now we have an enzyme substrate complex where the C terminal of our protein is now attached to the serine of our serine proteases. Most serine proteases have a ping pong, ping pong mechanism, and what you actually see here is the enzyme substrate complex that is an intermediate in many of the ping pong, ping pong mechanisms of serine proteases. So now we have a C-terminal portion of our peptide attached to the serine. The next step is a water molecule comes in. So water is going to come in here, and that water goes into the active site. We still have that hydrogen bond pulling from these hydrogen bonds from aspartic acid and histidine pulling it this way, but this time it's pulling on this water molecule. The N3 atom of the histidine imidazolium side chain pulls on this hydrogen, making this oxygen very nucleophilic. It's going to do a nucleophilic attack on this carbonyl group that's attached to the serine. This pair of electrons goes to the oxygen, and we have a second tetrahedral intermediate. The second tetrahedral intermediate will collapse because it has a very low half-life. We have the second oxyanion hole that's going to be stabilized by small amino acid residues or positively charged amino acid residues. And the hydrogen bond pulling still is occurring. It's pulling at this hydrogen, making this oxygen very nucleophilic. And now you have a tetrahedral intermediate that's going to collapse. It collapses when this pair of electrons goes back to form that C double bond O. Now this pair of electrons formerly from the CO bond goes back to form that hydrogen bond between this hydrogen and that oxygen. So you have regenerated the original state. The hydrogen bonding pulling is still occurring, but now this hydrogen bond pulling is between this oxygen and this H that's going to be pulled by this N3 atom of the histidine side chain, which is going to be reinforced in its pulling by this N1H hydrogen bond with the aspartic acid side chain. So this hydrogen bond network is pulling electron density and polarity in 
the direction of the red diagonal arrow. So that's what happens. The tetrahedral intermediate collapses. The C terminus is now formed. We now have a hydrogen bond that's going to form between this OH and this N3 atom. And we've regenerated essentially the exact same configuration, the exact same formation of the catalytic triad as before. So here's our hydrogen bond, and the C-terminal portion of the peptide actually leads. So we have regenerated the original configuration so that a second round can occur. Here are two structures of serine proteases that I've aligned together using pimol. One of them is chymotrypsin that has a PDBID number of 5CHA, and the other protein is trypsin that has a PDBID number of 5PTP. So I've opened these up in pimol and I went ahead and lined them up. Uh, one of these serine proteases comes from cow, originated from cow. Uh, that's where it's, uh, it's been isolated and its structure determined from. And the second PDB um, structure originated from wild boar. So um, two different organisms, two different uh, serine proteases with two different specific, uh, specificity sites, two different serine proteases with two different cut sites in terms of specificity of the peptide bond. And you notice, as I zoom in here, you don't see a lot of divergence, um, particularly in this region. Um, it's probably the random coils uh, line up, but um, they are not really well aligned. But what I've done is highlighted the, the catalytic triad, those three amino acids that are essential for function. And um, while other amino acids do not line up as well, um, and there could be some mismatch. If you look carefully at the side chains of histidine, there's the histidine side chain. And you look at serine, there's your serine side chain. And then finally, I'll zoom out here, and here's your aspartic acid side chain in yellow. You notice that the trypsin and chymotrypsin from two different organisms, their side chains line up very, very well. There's a very good uh, overlay. You can actually get an RMS D value for how well or how close these side chains on these amino acid residues line up to one another. But this just illustrates uh, in a point about how these three amino acids of the catalytic triad, serine, histidine, and aspartic acid, um, line up not uh, you may have a divergent structure in terms of tertiary structure the blue and the green don't align that well across uh, the entire uh, spectrum of the protein uh, but um, if you look at it in terms of the three-dimensional structure from the point of view of the catalytic triad where catalysis occurs then the um, the alignment looks very well so this is a classic example where uh, the tertiary structure may be divergent, but the catalytic activity and the catalytic structure is convergent. So we would expect chymotrypsin and trypsin, two serine proteases, to have the exact same mechanism because their catalytic triads, amino acids line up, while the other portion of the protein does not line up.